Welcome to another presentation of the POI Cantar Digital Transformation Webinar Series. Today's enterprise planning is most effective when built on a common foundation of data, processes, systems, and also fully utilized by the cross-functional organization. To get the organization on all the same page and to ensure all needs are captured, POI recommends executing a pre-designed assessment of the current state, yet with the lens to the future. We'll learn the whys and the how behind Cliff Barr's pre-design assessment. Now for a bit of webinar logistics. Please enable your pop-ups within your browser. Turn on your system sound to hear the streaming presentation. To submit a question, you just type them into the Ask a Question text box at the bottom left of the console. We're going to answer as many questions as time permits during the presentation and also afterwards via email. Now, if slides are not advancing, please press the F5 key or Control R on your keyboard to refresh your console and click Help or Submit a Question if you need assistance. If you don't know me, I am Pam Brown, Commercial Officer and Partner of the Promotion Optimization Institute and your host for this webinar. And I'm joined by our panel, Typhoon Ukar, who is the Senior Director of Business Insights at Cliff Bar. Emily Penaranda, the Associate Project Manager, Enterprise Strategy at Clefbar, and Alan Shankland, Global VP, Technology Advisory, <clears throat> Cantar Consulting Division. As we stated earlier, this is one of the Cantar and POI Digital Transformation Webinar Series. You can join our webinars to learn from experts and CPG market leaders on how to implement successful digital transformation programs to achieve commercial excellence, efficiency and profitability growth. Stay tuned for the additional installments of our webinars. Details will be announced soon. And at the end of this session, we'll talk about the previous webinars and how to access them. Now let's get started with the presentation and also hear about Cliff Barr's journey. I'm going to hand the mic over to Alan Shanklin to present what a pre-designed assessment is. Up to you, Alan. Thank you very much, Pam, and good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I, I think just uh, to set a little bit of context um, before we get into uh, the panel discussion with Typhoon and Emily, um, we thought it'd be helpful just to take a moment to set the context of what is a pre-design assessment, uh, where did the concept come from, to uh, the process and the project of implementing uh, TPM solutions. So I think one thing uh, that we, I'm sure we can all agree on is that any process to implement TPM um, is, is it's a large project and, and it's a complex project because of the nature uh, of what we're doing, uh, the number of different integration points and the number of stakeholders. Uh, that are involved in the overall process. And so one of our observations at Kantar um, was that uh, jumping straight into design workshops right out of the gate at the beginning of a project can actually lead to some challenges during the design phase of the project, that early phase. And this is the primary reason now that when we work with our clients, uh, we recommend uh, having a, a pre-design engagement. So, you know, these challenges can arrive from, from many different places, and of course, each project is unique and different. Um, but typically what we find is that these challenges can come from, from four major areas. So these would be starting out with a real lack of clarity and understanding of today's business processes, and indeed uh, an understanding of the pain points and therefore an understanding of what the uh, updated, the renewed 2B business processes might be. So having a lack of clarity about the future destination and where we're starting from can, can really be, be troublesome once uh, we get into the design process. I think the, the other thing that can happen, uh, not by uh, malice, uh, but simply the nature of the, the project, the fact that people's uh, thought process continues to evolve as, as they engage through these projects, 
is that during design, sometimes we can see some unexpected surprises or some new requirements that start to emerge. And it's really driven by the conversations that happen during that process. And that, that can be something that, that can cause a challenge as well. Again, referring back to something I mentioned briefly earlier, we've got a large number of stakeholders on these projects, uh, a, a number of different business functions that, that may have differential and, and sometimes competing requirements that they want to place into the scope of the project and for the specification. And so, you know, getting on, on a common platform uh, early is something that's quite important. And, and the last piece, I guess, is perhaps more of a mindset thing which is you know, being open to looking at how to do things differently rather than simply replicating what happens today with them. And, and when these challenges arise, uh, I, I think what we've experienced uh, and what we see is that that can lead to problems around making key decisions that impact the overall design process. And we know there are interdependencies between decisions and therefore that can be very disruptive. It, it can also lead to a situation we've got a large number of unresolved open questions that take time to answer and, and people sometimes need the thinking space to go away, consider the options uh, before coming back and making a decision. And, and the consequence of that is that we can see uh, extensions to the design phase because of the, these challenges and, and these delays and that in turn can have a knock-on impact to the overall project plan uh, and can put at risk what are often um, you know, quite fixed plans in terms of the cutover related to the existing business processes. So these, these were the observations that, that took us to a point where we started to think about uh, the need for some kind of pre-design uh, engagement and activity. So as we think about what that should look like, you know, what is it that we should be trying to achieve? And I think really there are four, four key areas that, that come to mind that we need to be considering. So the first one is to be really clear for all parties that we have a common understanding of the business needs and requirements, the role that TPM is going to play, the specific functionality that needs to be supported in the system relating back to the, the key business processes that have been identified. But importantly, that also has to be tied back to the current reality and capability of the business. Uh, and it's important that we do that process to make sure that the aims and the needs and, and the requirements are, are indeed realistic, not just from an implementation point of view, but as part of the broader process of change management. It's a step that is manageable uh, for the client business as part of the overall change process. I think the, the other thing that, that we find is as you get beyond the RFP process uh, uh, and, and start to move into design, clearly the precision and the detail of requirements starts to deepen. Uh, there are more conversations, there's more nuance, and as a result of this, we can uncover some challenges. So to give you a couple of examples, uh, perhaps the quality and the structure of master data, uh, wherever that resides. Uh, and, and that can impact how your TPM solution works and how the processes operate within it. Or, or it's possible that we might find that there's a gap in the core functionality as those detailed requirements start to become more crystallized. And therefore, we need to think about what's the, the solution uh, that we can develop, uh, whether it's a customization, a configuration, or, or indeed possibly thinking about how to adapt the business process. And, and that can need some time and thinking space that can often be difficult in a de design workshop where those workshops often are sequenced quite close together. And so both teams need, need the benefit of that thinking space. And, and again, by tackling some of the, the design topics early, and it's by no means all topics, um, we can anticipate and uncover these challenges early, and it helps us to have the opportunity to address them, to make some early decisions that then get carried forward into the main design process, and that can then help keep the team focused and accelerate the overall design process. 
and I guess the the other thing is that that this gives a first real view of the business um, in terms of how much change is going to happen. How much change do we think uh, that the business overall is going to have to manage through the conduct of the project and moving into go live? And it's really beneficial to get that early expectation setting. And that's something that, again, is important to communicate uh, to project stakeholders. So overall, what we see is the opportunity to get early insight to, to challenges and issues, to have some thinking space to develop potential solutions, and overall start to reduce the project risk. Uh, by ensuring that we, we, we eliminate some of these known challenges early in the process. And that helps keep the overall project on track. So starting to think about what that means in practical terms, you know, what, what does the structure of a pre-design activity look like? Well, it, it starts with uh, a consideration and alignment between uh, both the vendor and the client on which are the key topics uh, that we either know from past projects can be challenging or things that have come up through the RFP process that we know are gonna need some more work during the overall design process. Uh, and, and we designate those as priority topics uh, to cover during the pre-design engagement. So having uh, set the agenda, identified the topics to focus on, uh, there are really three three key stages to the process. So there's a period of initial discovery, and this is an opportunity to gather information, go a little bit deeper into uh, the topic areas that have been identified, uh, deeper than would have been uh, covered during the RFP uh, and, and the early discovery process, and really starting to think about business process, uh, data required to support the certain activities, the capabilities of the organization, uh, and, and also potential integration points uh, between the TPM solution uh, and other enterprise solutions that, that fuel the overall end-to-end -end process. So discovery is where we start. And then we go through a process of exploration, uh, taking each topic in turn, making sure we're uncovering and diagnosing and, and defining the pain points, the needs and requirements and, and then doing, doing a fit relative to the overall core solution functionality. And at the same time, bringing forward best practice uh, from industry and from past projects so that uh, we can facilitate a process of early learning along the journey. And, and through the process of exploration, we typically uncover a small number of big rocks or big issues uh, that require some further focused attention and effort on behalf of both the parties to work through what the potential options and solutions are to overcome any issues or challenges that have been identified. So there's a period then of, of working both independently and collaboratively around those solutions and, and then regrouping at the end of the process really to, to come back and distill all the key learning from the early part of the process to share and explore and refine the different solutions uh, that have been developed uh, in the intervening period after the exploration phase, uh, and then to, to settle on a series of design principles and decisions which carry forward into design, and, and they become set, and then that provides a framework uh, to have an accelerated and smoother design workshop around those challenging topics. Now, the other thing that, that we, we often do uh, alongside this is that we, we also provide feedback for our clients around uh, their readiness as a business, both in terms of uh, the, the, the readiness to engage in a specific topic uh, in the design process overall, or indeed in the case of master data, uh, thinking structurally about the state of master data and the readiness of master data to support a TPM project. So uh, again, uh, as well as providing that readiness assessment, we're providing a series of recommendations to our clients um, about how they can then get best prepared uh, to, to enter an efficient design process that in turn helps to uh, the on-time delivery of the overall project. 
Okay, a, a couple of final thoughts because th there are a number of additional benefits here, but I want to be brief so that you can have the opportunity to, to hear from our, our colleagues uh, from Cliff Bar. Um, but I, I guess four, four key things that come out, and this is, this is what we hear from our clients uh, as we engage in these types of activities, that this is a, a perfect opportunity uh, before the formal commencement of design to, to reconfirm and clarify any of the key elements of project scope and requirements that may not yet be absolutely set. So this is an opportunity to do that. Uh, as I mentioned briefly before, it's an opportunity early in the process to share best practice from across industry, from other projects, and it's an opportunity to challenge some of the norms and established practices uh, and behaviors in the business um, that may open up opportunities to, to operate and work it in a better and more efficient way. It also helps to be clear uh, for both parties about making sure we have the right subject matter experts in the room for each of the upcoming design decisions. So it's a process that can help to clarify that. And then perhaps really importantly, because we know these projects have ups and downs and, and, and challenges and they're quite intense, it's a fantastic opportunity for both the teams to get to know each other, to build those relationships and establish a, a good pattern of collaboration before heading off into design implementation and, and ultimately go live. So with that, uh, I'm now going to hand back over to you, Pam, and uh, look forward to hearing the discussion. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you for taking us through the foundation of that pre-design assessment that's so critical to really helping to implement a successful long-term project that gets the user adoption that we all, what we all are looking for, right? So now it's time to check in with our Cliff panel. So here's our first question. Typhoon, can you tell us about Cliff Bar's TPX planning journey and the transformation? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us. Uh, we're excited about the opportunity to share some of our experiences regarding uh, our TPM journey as well as our specific um, um, uh, experiences around pre-design assessment. Um, so, uh, Pam, you know this a little bit, but uh, we've been on this journey for the past two years. And uh, for us, the TPM transformation is part of our bigger initiative of integrated forecasting. Um, currently, at Cliff Bar, we have three disjointed planning processes, uh, namely demand planning, sales planning, and revenue planning. And these three processes are not linked to each other currently. Um, our overall goal is to combine them to have a holistic, integrated uh, forecasting process. So um, on the sales side, this, uh, it starts with having the right system and processes. Um, we're currently using a tool that was developed a long time ago and uh, refined over the years. Uh, this Excel-based tool uh, does a lot of stuff very well for us, but then you know, started to fall short of some of our expectations as the business continued to grow in size and became more complex. So when we started this uh, journey two years ago, what became clear was how much progress has been made in this space too. Uh, we have a lot of people who had experience with TPM in the past and um, their experiences and what we've seen in the marketplace was starkly different. And um, I have to give props to PLI. Uh, PLI has been a very great, uh, has been a great partner and resource for us as we continue to increase our understanding and knowledge about the TPM space. And then when we laid out this three year plan. Um, so, just to give you a little bit more perspective, uh, for us, year one was all about discovery and vendor selection process. Uh, we initially started with, uh, with five vendors for the RFP and then uh, moved ahead with our top two choices for the proof of concept phase. From there, we picked our preferred uh, TPM partner, Kantar. Um, the, Theme for year two, which is what we're going through right now, is getting ready for the implementation. Uh, we're currently working on the results and the recommendations of the pre-design assessment work that we went through with Kantar. And then core team members are engaged in different work streams to help us get ready for the implementation. 
So, and next year, 2021, which will be the year three, is going to be uh, about implementation. If all goes well, we're hoping to go live uh, with the sales piece in August and with the settlements piece at the end of 2021. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a um, um, you know taste for what our journey has been like and what we're still uh, what's still ahead for us. Absolutely, Typhoon. Can you can you share a little bit more too of why the organization decided to engage in the pre-design assessment versus just head right into you know business requirements and and picking a vendor? Why the desire to do that pre-assessment? What was foundational there? Sure. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we have been using an Excel-based planning tool and had no prior TPM experience. Um, you know, Ellen alluded to this a little bit. Um, knowing that TPM projects are large and complex, uh, we decided early on that it was important to do an assessment. And technically what we were doing was slowing things down to build momentum for later. That was the key thing for us. So the, our primary goal with the pre-design assessment was uh, really to understand our readiness, uncover problem areas, pain points, and uh, develop potential solutions by making some early decisions. Um, at the end of the day, we wanted to reduce the potential risks of, uh, uh, during the implementation. And in hindsight, this has been one of the better decisions we made. Um, given where we are and uh, what's ahead of us. Absolutely. I mean, it just it makes sense to take that time and to plan it well, right? If you're going to do a project this large, just like Alan said, these are large projects, so we need to take the time to do the due diligence. Emily, what were some of the key benefits and learnings of the assessment that you and your team saw? Oh, thanks for having us today, Pam. Um, the first thing was really that holistic approach is critical. Um, so Alan mentioned that our assessment was about two weeks and we went through that discover phase. So, so much of this work is interconnected and it really helped us lay everything out on the table, both for us and for the vendor. So we went through topics such as a day in the life of an account man manager, IT integrations, execution and settlement, and that gave us time to understand how topics were dependent to each other and level set with our core team of how things were dependent. So we were really able in that holistic approach to see what we had, where our bigger gaps were, our smaller gaps were, and help us understand the big picture a lot better. It also gave us that focused time with a vendor to consider our barriers and our risks. And what I appreciated is Cantar is able to give guidance to help us refine our approach. So we're able to start thinking about our scope earlier, and they're able to provide some recommendations from their own best practices to help guide us. That is so helpful to have those best practices, right? You, you know, when you don't do this every day, and you don't have a window to what others do as, as much as, as a vendor does or like POI does. It's helpful to have someone come in and share what is best so that you can start. You don't want to jam old processes into a new system, right? You want to you take that on and, and learn and adjust. What, out of all of that, though, what surprised you, right? What surprised you and your teams when you went through that pre-assessment? What were the big aha moments? Um, I think let me take a stab at it. No, I was going to say, uh, one more thing that I want to add about the benefits, and again, this is something that I'll mention before, um, it's basically getting a better feel about the tool as well as building a relationship collaboration between the core project team and Kantar. We, we think that that's going to pay a lot of dividends as we get into the um, design phase and as we uh, embark on the implementation process. And that knowledge that was acquired uh, through both teams will uh, be useful uh, and helpful during the implementation. Um, Emily, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I think just what surprised us um, was seeing everything laid out on the table and understanding that um, 
we we are we had a good idea of what we needed to prioritize and i think for us it what it's helped us show that where our gut was was right and it helped us get on track and really buy in as a core team and also an organization that and, makes a lot uh, of sense when me, you get that buy-in you can move in the same direction right the typhoon go ahead no, I was going to say, for me, uh, the, the first thing was how much work was needed before we start the implementation. Uh, I mean, uh, we knew that going into the assessment that there was going to be um, a lot of things that we need to uh, do in order to get ready, but um, it was still kind of an eye-opener. And a great example is that the, the customer master data. We knew that the customer hierarchy was going to be a challenge, but once we started getting into it, uh, we were glad that we started tackling this ahead of time. Uh, and the whole point of assessment was to give us time to smooth out these potential pain points. So um, that's working really well. Yes, and you'll find, if for those of you who are on the call, if you're looking at uh, taking on a project in the TPM, TPO, TPX space, one, do a pre-assessment, but really look at your master data, right? That's the foundation for these capabilities. And when you have good data going in, you have good results, you know, and reporting coming out too, and, and good view to your business. Typhoon, how has the pre-designed assessment refined thinking around Cliff Bar business requirements for the TPX solution? So, um, you know, as I mentioned, this is, uh, we had not been using it um, and, um we have been using this tool in the process when it comes to planning. Uh, and this this um, project basically forced us to have a beginner's mindset and think about where we want to go versus what we're currently doing. Uh, so the assessment helps us by bringing the best practice framework to challenge the status quo, uh, change some of our current business processes, and just because we have been doing something in a particular way does not necessarily mean that it's the right approach. So that was the, the, the huge understanding and the learning that we've gotten through the assessment. So I'd say those are some of the key things that um, was um, that we uh, derived from the, the assessment work. And Emily, how has the pre-assessment helped frame thinking around change management? Now, Alan talked about change management, and if you've ever come to a POI summit, which I'm sure a lot of you have, we talk about change management a ton, right? How are you shaping your core team and aligning, and aligning those project team goals? So two parts, how has the pre-assessment helped frame the thinking around change management, and then also, how are you shaping your core team and aligning project team goals? Um, the pre-assessment has definitely put us on a path of change management. And I'm from the enterprise strategy team at Cliff Bar, and that's a big part of our role is helping the organization prepare for change and transition through that time of change. So really, um, one of the big things that we've had come out of this is the conversations with cross-functional partners early and often. So recognizing that there's going to be impact on a lot of different teams, some people will have major impact, others with um, a little bit lesser, but bringing them into the conversations now so that they can see too how this tool is gonna help transform the organization. It also was nice to, for the vendor to have a preview of where we are and where we're headed so that they can help us bridge from our current state to TPX. Um, there's more than one way to do it, so, just having them understand where we're coming from as an organization and we can bridge our change management practices together and really collaborate. Um, how has that shaped our core team and alignment to project team goals? Right now, a lot of our core team that was on the assessment, they are working on work streams that have come out of the assessment. Right now, they're really focusing on structural components such as the customer master data and the product master data. And we're helping them prepare to become leads next year in implementation and really be our change makers. So our experts are really getting experience now. They're working with the right people and we're just on that road of preparation. And the last thing I wanna call out here is that just the 
over communication, I think right now, especially with being remote is something that we've really been um, in tune with of as a core team and with TPM happening, really keeping people in the loop um, and feeling that wanting them to feel that they know what's going on and what our goals are as a team. Emily, that makes um, so much uh, sense. And if you think about it, uh, sorry, you could type in, go ahead. I was going to say one more thing that I would add to the change management. Uh, we all know how critical that will be uh, as part of the implementation process. Um, our, as I mentioned, our organization has been uh, anxiously waiting for this transformation. And um, we have a sales team who's very eager to make this change. So a part of our challenge is actually to align people's expectations with the speed of this transformation. Uh, when I think about the TPM and uh, the long journey ahead of us, that can take uh, anywhere from three to five years to really realize all of the benefits. So that's another uh, part that we need to work internally to kind of align people's expectations about what we can achieve uh, quickly, uh, the quick wins that we can get, as well as uh, what's ahead and uh, how long it'll, it will take uh, for this to be a successful transformation. That's a great ad, Typhoon, and it, it probably is right into um, what I was going to say. You know, as you, I love that you and Cantor are partnering early because as, as they share best practices, as you build out your future ongoing and dynamic roadmap, right? So it's not just deploy the TPM, it's, it's TPM and then what? And then what's next? And then, option, you know what I mean? You can, you can develop this roadmap Absolutely. of capabilities for your internal organization so it's not just this big bomb that hits them it's it's really a planned capabilities improvement right um, and you know I, I love now we're going to have a chance to take questions from our audience this is a great part of the day now if you haven't submitted a question yet audience members all you have to do is type your question into the ask a question text box at the bottom left of your console we're going to get started. We have a couple that have already come in, and, and they're actually really good. So this is a good one. Let's see. It says, um, how did COVID affect the pre-design assessment approach and planning of the implementation, especially because we're all working remotely? Uh, let me take a stab at it first, and then I'll pass it on to uh, <laughs> Emily. Um, um, just like anybody else, I think uh, the COVID has impacted us immensely too um, and kind of threw a big wrench into our uh, pre-design assessment uh, plan. Um, initially, what we did was to quickly pivot from an in-person uh, sessions to uh, online sessions. That was the first thing that we decided to early on. And when we were looking at uh, the early experiences of the um, internal teams that were having these, uh, you know, Zoom sessions, realized that it's impossible to have a full day Zoom session talking about TPM for eight hours. <laughs> so we decided to extend the timeline a little bit, and what would be a typical four to six week engagement, I think, uh, became more like a. Uh, eight weeks or so uh, engagement uh, for us. So Cantar um, was very accommodating and were willing to work with us to kind of um, have a new um, timeline and uh, a process that worked for both parties. And um, I think uh, the, the key difference between an online session versus an in-person was, again, uh, how long we could actually have uh, each day. Uh, so it required a lot of um, um, strong project management um, of work. So again, Kantar and Emily has been super helpful on that front. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we realize is we can actually do this uh, remotely. And even though uh, at times there's been some challenges, um, the work has been going on and I think um, we were exactly where we wanted to be. And uh, on that front, um, I also have to say that uh, our plans for next year's implementation, which will start with the design, is to be also on uh, online and remote. So we're going to be using all the learnings that we've gathered throughout the uh, pre-design assessment phase and then apply those for the implementation. So 
while it might not be ideal, uh, I think we're making the best of it and working with the realities of the current situation. Um, to add to that, and, I think for us um, going to that remote project plan and pivoting, one of the biggest things was really a strong relationship with the Kantar project manager and with Alan um, to be able to share our reflections and experience throughout that week. Um, I think as we're all familiar with uh, right now with remote, it's a little bit harder to read the room and get people's reactions. So on the cliff side, I really took that into consideration and the, the assessment was two weeks and within three days, just talking to the team, the Cliff team about how can we pivot? How can we make this time more valuable? What's working, what's not? Um, and relaying that and having a conversation with Kantar so that we can just really make sure that use of time since it was limited um, was really valuable for everyone. Well, I know that COVID has taught us all to be agile and nimble, right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. everything that, that that Typhoon and and you are talking about, Emily, really comes down to reading your people, knowing what they can handle, you know, being proactive and being well planned. And uh, it's great. Now, here's another question, and quite a few folks have put this one in. Um, how did you prioritize? And th this goes with that last one. <laughs> how did you prioritize? the pre-work that came out of the assessment. Right, I'll take that one. Uh, so we got our assessment results about yeah, eight weeks after and it came really nicely put together with um, best practices, recommendations, watch outs from the Cantar team. Um, but we had about 12 to 15 items that needed to ideally be addressed before we entered design. and. Cantor had put together sort of a, a first um, pass prioritization of what they think was the most important. And we agreed with most of those, but we didn't necessarily have the bandwidth to do all four of them at the same time. And so the first step we took was really looking at, uh, with the core team, looking at all of the 12 to 15 work streams, understanding how they were interconnected, what was structural, um, what was data integration related, what was more of work stream, um, like work business process related. So we were able to break out these work streams into categories and have a prioritization activity as a team saying, if we have to pick one thing, what is the most important? Um, let's, we have to pick it. Um, so for that, that was actually our customer master data. And then we were able to go through and just prioritize things in the like must, must address right away, um, still critical, but not our number one priority. And then more of the areas that are highly influenced by things like customer uh, master data and product master data. Um, it was a really great exercise too, to just get the team all on board of what are, here are our priorities, here's how we're going to attack it. And we were able to share that with Kantar too, to show them this is how we're approaching it. What feedback do you have? What call outs do you have? So here's a, here's a good one for both of you. If you were, this is the postmortem part, right? If you were going to do this assessment again, what would you do differently? You were gonna start all over, make some changes. Let me, let me. Uh, start and then again I'll hand it off to Emily and my answer is going to be pretty simple I actually wouldn't change anything um, I've um, talked a little bit about our approach and um, this slowing down uh, or um, kind of uh, taking time to build momentum and assessment really allowed us to do that so uh, going into uh, the whole TPM journey uh, our approach was actually um, or our, our initial plan was to do things in a shorter time frame but due to all the things that we've learned also uh, internal uh, priorities uh, around uh, corporate um, projects we decided to take this approach and again like looking at hindsight uh, especially what we're going through right now I'm glad that we decided to do that um, what we really learned from this process and the time uh, that we're 
or the time that we're using to get uh, get ready is going to be very, very helpful and beneficial, especially during uh, the implementation period when uh, we're not together and remote. So I think, as I mentioned, my answer is simple. I think this is we're very happy with the way we've approached this. Uh, there are some small things that we could have done uh, differently, but I think overall, uh, I'd say this is this has gone pretty well for us. Emily, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I agree with you, Typhoon. I think we did choose best case scenario. I think one call that I have from like more of the project management perspective is after those two weeks of assessment, although we were tired, I think, from you know really giving it our all. There was a lot of excitement and um, fire around what, you know, what are we going to do next? What are Cantor's recommendations going to be? Like, where can we get started now? And I think for us, we had that excitement, but it was also a time, too, for us to, like, put it on the brakes and wait for Cantor to give us information back as much as we might have wanted to get started. Um, we're, you know, we're waiting for that best practice recommendation. So that was just a call out of for, you know, thinking about the team and the energy around it. Here's a good one for you both. What are some examples of the quick wins that you're expecting versus your longer term benefits? More down the roadmap. Yeah. Um... That's a good question. I think uh, in the short term, uh, we really want to uh, understand um, how we're spending our money. And when I say this, it sounds a little uh, quirky, and uh, the question might be, don't you know where you're spending your money? And it's easier said than that, I think, just um, really having a, a, a firm handle on uh, where the money is being spent and what the opportunities are for efficiency is going to be one of the key pieces uh, and uh, key uh, improvement areas that we're going to focus on. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, we have been using for a long time and uh, uh, a tool that we developed internally on an Excel basis. And that tool, uh, what we've learned, again, through the conversations that we've had with the industry experts is that um, a very um, uh, strong tool and a phenomenal tool when it comes to planning. But when it comes to accountability, that's where things start to fall short of. So um, if this is, I mean, I, like if this is any um, 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 indication, we're kind of uh, going blindly when it comes to uh, the, the uh, trade promotions and the trade spending. So that's one of the things that we really uh, – so that's one of the things that we think we're going to get an immediate benefit. But over the long run, again, uh, some of the things that we're looking at as part of this journey is the optimization piece. So we want to get uh, some learnings under our belt and start uh, feeding uh, data into the TPM tool to be able to utilize the tool and uh, get going with the optimization. So that's going to be the next phase, I think. Emily, did you have anything to add there on your quick wins or your long-term roadmap from your perspective? No, I agree with Typhoon. I think um, okay. that, yeah, thanks. Good. Okay, well, we have our next, I just didn't want to miss you. So, okay, let's take our next question. So, what is your top Cliff Bar data challenge? And how are you aligning trade and marketing promotions, advertising, coupons, et cetera, you know, into you know, obviously there's tons of data, and are you going to align that more digital marketing aspects? I think is what he's asking. And on top of what is your data challenge? Emily, you want to take a stab at the data challenge, and I can kind of chime in. <laughs> yeah, I can take a stab at the data challenge. Um, I think for us right now as an organization, we're really interested in consumption data, and just my understanding of consumption data is that it can come in a lot of different ways. Um, you have it directly from customers, you have it through IRI, um, and just really making that data accessible to the right people and making it easy to use. Um, so at Cliff Bar, this will be impacted by TPM, but we also have a separate initiative really to drill down and make it accessible and easy. Um, 
and TPM will be affected by this um, because we would like to have consumption data in the tool. Um, so that's, I think, our biggest data challenge. Um, and what for you me, have? yeah, for me, um, we talked about the master data and um, the, the complications that may uh, come out of the master data as we start digging into it. And for us, I mentioned earlier again, about the customer master data. Because uh, these three uh, separate processes, demand planning, sales planning, and revenue planning were all disjointed, there was no requirement for the customer data to be, or customer hierarchy to be um, uh, consistent across these three different platforms. So that's one of the challenges that I mentioned that came uh, out uh, early on. And it's going to be uh, something that we're going to spend quite a bit of time um, both uh, this year as well as during the design phase. So the master data is, uh, and specifically customer master data, was one of the big challenges. When it came to the product master data, I think we're in a pretty good shape because of the way we do our planning and how that's going to be um, um, uh, be done in the TPM. So that's that. There's still some work to be done, but not as big as the customer master data. When it comes to the um, uh, promotions and specific digital or marketing promotions, one of the big uh, pain points for us was actually the account specific marketing. And um, the hope is uh, with the TPM, we'll also be able to integrate that piece into our uh, spending platform or uh, into our planning. We do um, account specific. We do account for the account specific uh, marketing right now, but it's a separate process and um, it's not uh, integrated into the sales planning. So uh, one of the requirements during the RFP and the uh, proof of concept scenarios was to be able to bring that data into the TPM and to be able to account for that um, uh, part of the spending. So I don't know if that helps or answers the question, but um, those are some of the uh, I, like thoughts that I have. Well, I definitely think it will help folks, especially as they're forward-thinking, right, about their own need, data needs going into their projects. So here's a good question that came in. Um, how quickly do you expect to fully exploit TPM capabilities? So, and we also had another question come in, so I, I will cover that really quickly. TPM stands for Trade Promotion Management. Okay, it's the ability to plan your promotions in a trade promotion management tool. Okay, so, and if you're looking for greater definitions and wanna learn more about TPM or TPO, which is trade promotion optimization, and there's various things you can do with optimizing, whether it's pricing, promotion, plans, you can head to the Promotion Optimization Institute site, Promotion Optimization Institute site, again, and there we are now tile-based, all new website. You have tiles on each of these topics that can teach you about what these things are and how it benefits an organization. So just wanted to make sure you are aware of those resources. So now, again, the question is, how quickly does Cliff expect to exploit these full TPM capabilities and then start maximizing the ROI? Um, I think we have some expectations about some uh, quick early wins, uh, but uh, personally, I want to, again, align expectations with the um, uh, excitement over the TPM and uh, what TPM can do uh, for our organization in the long run. So um, I think, uh, uh, like, early on, uh, my expectations are quite low, and it's all about getting the right data into the tool and start making some, um, you know, or gaining some learnings about uh, some of the key areas that we're spending and how to um, tackle some of the inefficiencies that we know is happening. But I think... Um, we expect to see a uh, return on investment right away, although I think the full benefit, we won't be realizing that probably, um, you know, the third or fourth year of the uh, the journey. And it also involves a little bit about the, the optimization piece. So I mentioned how this is going to be a long-term journey for us, and it starts with the TPM implementation, but... Uh, from there on, uh, we're going to move on to the optimization if all goes well, and that's when we're going to really fully leverage the data that's going to be available for us on the uh, uh, trade promotion management software. So 
Um, I think personally, um, I'm not. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to be gaining some understanding, and uh, it'll be a, a positive return on investment. But I'm really looking forward to kind of what this could mean for us in the next two to five years. I have a little bit of a longer term approach, I think. Yes, absolutely. Well, you need that short term and long term, right? Absolutely, yeah. Emily, anything on this one? Anything on this one, Emily? No, we have I, a good one coming you. up too. Okay, so here's a good one. How are you handling? Back to data again, here, guys. How are you handling <laughs> POS data and consumption data since IRI Nielsen? And was it aggregated into a data warehouse? This is a really good question. Uh, yeah, it is. And uh, it's interesting because we're kind of uh, grappling with that piece right now. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, uh, the POS data and the consumption data is going to be a key piece of uh, the, uh, the data that we're going to be utilizing in order to, again, make better decisions along with the uh, TPM uh, and trade spending data. So right now uh, we have, you know, we're getting our consumption data through IRI and we have also a bunch of other um, consumption data that we get through either third party or retailer specific uh, platforms. Um, so when it came to uh, data uh, aggregation and harmonization, one of the things that we decide to do is to have sort of a two prong approach. Um, one is a little bit of a short-term solution, and the, sec uh, the other one is a, a bit of a longer-term solution. In terms of the short-term solution, uh, we've decided to use, again, a, a service that Kantar offered us uh, in terms of the data harmonization uh, to take all of the, um, um, and right now we have, um, we've listed 14, but it could be longer, but 14 disparate data sources that we have when it comes to uh, consumption and um, taking all of that data, uh, cleansing and harmonizing and feeding into the TPM as part of the uh, service that we chose to. So uh, we're planning on doing that and uh, uh, we're looking at that as kind of the short term solution. In the longer term perspective, our uh, business intelligence team is in the process of integrated, uh, in integrating all of the consumption data. Uh, we have uh, that's coming from these sources and uh, in, uh, creating a kind of a uh, data warehouse, data lake, so to speak. And in the longer term, I think what we're hoping to do is to be um, to have the capability and the ability to get all this da uh, data internally and then use this data in the TPM through the data warehouse that we have uh, from the business intelligence um, uh, team. So that's kind of our approach, and uh, again, it's like two prong approach basically. That's fantastic. It's always good to have a planned approach, and and as many prongs as you can to do it to deliver it in stages, right? That crawl, walk, run approach. And this brings yes. us to our last question, and one that uh, you know we need to pr do pretty quickly if we want to squeeze it in. With that three-year timeline, right, and you've got this ongoing dynamic roadmap that you're planning, how do you keep your solution and your design and everything that you assessed up to date, right? How do you do that? How do you keep it relevant? Uh, and I think part of this is also the, the changes that we're experiencing with the, um, the industry and the TPM landscape. As I mentioned um, earlier in my conversation that, we have a lot of people that have worked with TPM in the past that have been part of these uh, on-premise solutions that are just one and down, and uh, you know the upgrades are just very complicated, um, costly. I think uh, the the those days are gone, and uh, it's a uh, brand new world right now on the TPM uh, of um, you know services and solutions uh, uh, solutions as well as quick upgrades. So we're uh, somewhat relying on uh, the technology and um, the, the vendor's willingness to upgrade and improve the pr um, uh, product, as well as I think as our capabilities and needs change, we're going to be assessing needs. But um, again, this is not going to be uh, a one and done, and uh, it'll be a, a, a constant and ongoing uh, uh, improvement in project. So. Um, 
it's a, I called it three years, but it's just once we start, I don't think it's going to end or it's ever going to end. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I laugh because that is so true. <laughs> Having done it, um, you know, it's it's fantastic and it's a journey. And you know, when you have a great partner, especially you've worked with Cantar through the pre-assessment, right? So you've built that relationship. It is SaaS. So as they do upgrades, you automatically start rolling into those upgrades and the new technology that they bring. So it's it's a phenomenal partnership. And, you know, we really thank you, Cliff team, for joining and, and sharing your experiences so that you can help others benefit from what you've learned and how you've grown. And we thank all of our attendees for attending the webinar and the conversation with Cliff Bar, Cliff Bar on the value and process of executing a pre-design assessment. And it is hosted by the Promotion Optimization Institute and sponsored by Cantar. Now, hey, this webinar is just one presentation in the POI Cantar Digital Transformation webinar series. You're going to have to check out the Cantar Digital Transformation site or the POIinstitute.com site because we have the previous webinars in the series available on demand when you have the time. And we'll show you here. Here's a couple of the different um, sessions, the new category management of data, knowledge, and experience. Campari, a transformational journey to deliver commercial excellence for growth. A conversation with Bell and Kellogg's driving sustainable commercial change and growth in 2020 and beyond. Now, don't forget to continue to ask questions, and the Cantar Cliff team will respond via email if you have them, or you can reach out to the Promotion Optimization Institute. We also have a survey today. Please fill out your feedback on today's presentation. It helps us all grow and know what you need for next time. Thank you again for your time. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you need help on your journey because POI and Cantar are here for you.